And I'm your host, Jordan. We are back again with a really great movie, in my opinion. A bonus episode, because you have to pay for it on streaming services. Oh, well, you don't have to pay for this podcast. <laughs> no, 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 this podcast is completely free. <laughs> uh, you have to, yeah, you have to pay for the movie. Um, or pirate it, but you shouldn't pirate it, because it's a young director, question mark. Yeah, he's 23 years old. It's the it's the the star of the movie is also the director. What? Yeah. Oh, I did not realize that. Yeah. Wait, let me check and see if he. I think he might have written it too. I'm almost positive. He's he's a modern day Orson Welles. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Uh, yeah. So today we're talking about the movie Shit House, which uh, Leah told me about. Maybe I don't know if she said it on pod or off pod, but she told me she watched it, it was a few off. weeks ago. Um, and I was very hesitant because she told me that I had to pay for it. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> my friend, I was up front because I'm an Aries, but my friend said to me, she, like, sold this movie to me. She was like, you have to watch it. Like, I hate most rom-coms, and, like, I don't even know if this is a rom-com, but, like, I, I she's like, you have to see it. Like, you're going to love it. It's so up your alley, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, it's on Prime. So I thought she meant it was on Prime. Like, I'm a Prime member, so I thought, oh, I'll just watch it. And then I, I was like, oh, six dollars, like... It's okay. funny. It's funny that this is like the most college movie, but like no college kid in their right mind would ever pay for a movie on a streaming service that their parents didn't already pay for. <laughs> right. But she just sold it so hard that like and I was so ready to watch it too. Like I had like got you know when you get ready to watch something and you've like hyped it up in your mind and you're all excited about it? Like there was no even if it was like twenty dollars, I probably would have paid it because I was just like, I need to see this. And just having to pay for it just added to the mystique. It was like I have to watch this. So yeah, it's um his name is Cooper Rafe. He directed it. He was one of three producers. He wrote it and he is the star of it. And I Which college did he go to? And um in real life? Yes. Um I don't know. Oh my gosh, he doesn't even have a, a Wikipedia page. His UCLA. name isn't even linked. Um but yeah, he's 23 years old and he also um he was one of two editors on the movie. So this is his movie, and its uh, budget was fifteen thousand dollars, and it's already made eighteen thousand. So uh, work. Wow. Okay. So that that changes a lot about how we talk about this film. I did not realize mm -hmm. a lot of this. So that is something I should have noticed when I watched the credits. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it's definitely. Uh, a romantic comedy. You don't see a lot of romantic comedies that take place in college. Yeah, and it's a genuine... Well, we should probably get into our... our before we get well, so far I, into the movie. Well, that's why I said it in the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a great segue. So, um, on Movie Cinema Film here, we normally, uh, in addition to reviewing a new movie, we usually recommend a couple of other movies that are somehow related to the one that we're watching, so we decided to just go broad with a uh, college movie recommendation. So, Jordan, what's your... Yeah, what can I say? We're some liberal coastal elites here. We're talking about college experiences, college, we love it, oh my gosh, get smart, uh, learn a way to stupid. Uh, <laughs> so the film I chose, a very college film, um, Spring Breakers <laughs> by Harmony Corinne. That is such a Jordan choice. I can't believe I didn't guess that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I came, I came to this movie kind of late. Um, <clears throat> But, like, as somebody who, like, I maybe went on one spring break trip, and it was just, like, living in a house, like, a beach kind of a thing, like, going to the beach with your friends kind of a thing. Like, I never did, like, the crazy spring break, and there's a lot of people in America, I think, who never got to do the crazy spring break that you no. see on TV. Uh, I think that's something that, like, MTV popularized so that, like, tourism culture would happen, you know, mm -hmm. with young people who are spending their parents' money, you know? Like, that is, like, a fabrication of TV. This spring break need to go to, like, Mexico, Cancun, like, let's go! We got a spring break 2020! Yeah! Like, going nuts, just getting drunk, and, like... And, the, and so many people this year insisted... Showing your tits in the back of a van. <laughs> like, yeah, they <laughs> insisted on doing it, even though it was right... Spring break was literally right when the pandemic hit, and we all had to go into lockdown, and there were still people like, yeah, whatever, man, like, you know, it's my one chance for... Blah, blah, blah. Like, oh my god, shut up. 
The Beastie Boys fought for this so that I have the right to party, man. They fought for this. They died for this, man. The Beastie Boys died for my right to party. No, um... <laughs> but yeah, I think this is a film for people who didn't get to go on the crazy spring break. You always hear about it. You see it. Uh, like, especially in our generation, like looking at Instagram and being like, wow, there's all these hot people on the beach. Like, wow, this looks really fun. Like, I wish I went on a spring break, you know? Like, it's, like, kind of that vibe. Um, and that's why I love this film, because, like, if you never went on a spring break, this is what you hope happens to all those hot people who go on spring break, is, like, you kind of hope the people have this happen. Yeah. Uh, it just quickly becomes, like, a horror comedy in a way that Harmony Corinne can only do. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, it just works super well. Like, James Franco is playing, like, a pseudo-real-life version of himself, a pseudo, like, riffraff character <laughs> of himself. Mm -hmm. It was like, James Franco is a sketchball who takes advantage of younger women. So, like, you kind of feel sketched out when you're watching this movie because you're like, well, one, they're with a riffraff character who's a rapist, and then also they're with a James Franco character, mm -hmm. <laughs> who we also know is a little sketch. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I just think that movie is just very iconic. It's very Florida. <laughs> yeah. There's, like, Harmony Corinne has been taking some dives into Florida culture, which I think explains a lot about American culture, because, uh, like, a lot of cultures created in L.A., and then there's also a lot of culture that's created in Florida, like Disneyland culture, and... That's uh, where I, I've been to Disney on spring break, not not partying on the beach, but that's me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, like, the amusement park culture, and, like, the culture of, like, Florida man culture, you know? Oh, my God. I think, like, this all kind of ties together, and the, like, budding porn industry in Florida and stuff like that, like... Florida is, like, wannabe, like, Republican California in a lot of ways. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, we could have nice weather. We could have, like, very liberal cities. Uh, but we could also not pay taxes. And we could also shoot anybody who comes into our yard. <laughs> well. Yes. Are you a fan of Spring Breakers? <laughs> in the middle on it. I think it's worth watching. It's, it's, like, it's part of, I just feel like it's part of this, uh, this era of film. Like, I feel like whatever this era is, whatever we will refer to it in the future as, like, I feel like it's definitely something that, if you want to get the full picture, Harmony Corinne is definitely, you know. And this is probably, I mean, you like the beach bum more than this, I'm guessing, right? You love that movie. Uh, yeah, I think they're like apples and oranges. Right. Like, a director like Harmony Corinne makes such different films, I think, when he makes them. Mm -hmm. Like, he obviously has a stylistic decisions where he does these, like, weird cuts that aren't, like, legal cuts that he, filmmakers aren't allowed to make, but mm -hmm. then he makes them anyway. Yeah. <laughs> like, where you're, like, going around a conversation and it's like, what drugs am I on right now that, like, I can't keep up with what's going on in this conversation? And it's like, oh, the editing is made this way mm -hmm. to be, like, choppy and disorienting. Um, but, yeah, I, d I think it definitely encapsulates a moment. Like, I don't think there is anybody who's really, like, captured that Girls Gone Wild, like, spring break, like culture that like mm -hmm. I grew up with as an American man being like marketed at nonstop. Like that's literally all I was marketed like as a kid is like uh like oh crazy spring break, crazy parties, like go to the beach, like what's gonna go? Like oh like then you start becoming like a porn watching American man and then you're just like, oh whoa they just went into the car and then they just wanted to get a t shirt. Whoa like it's just a weird, like, subsection, like, of porn before, like, the internet was, like, huge, so then it was also just, like, manipulation, and it was bad, because people didn't realize the scope of the internet, so, like, people were showing their tits, because they were just, like, what does this even matter? And, like, that yeah. has become, like, part of spring break, is everybody's just, like, tits out, why not? Like, everybody's doing it, but then it's also, like, yeah, everybody's also taping this, because, like, there's documentary crews everywhere, because it's corporate, and people want to put this on TV for all the people who can't buy it. 
and by you guys being out here like being hot and doing drugs like you're just giving a fantasy to all the people at home who can't be out here hot and doing drugs it uh is amazing to me how successful joe francis was with that because like it's just so funny to think that there was a time really not too long ago where you know it was exciting to a man to like buy a DVD in the middle of the night that would, you know, then get shipped to him three weeks later because it, there was no <laughs> Amazon Prime. And, and like, just to see women show their boobs, like, just to scream and lift up their top, like, not even, not even, like, sex. Like, just really, like, I mean, you can see anything. You can see the most depraved, like, something you never even would think of. You could, you could suddenly realize and then type in and see it within seconds. It's just so funny that... I mean, in Girls Gone Wild did did well. Like, that guy was rich as hell. It's just so funny to me. It is really funny how, like, there is an aspect to it where it's like, yeah, sex is what my parents do, but, like, I just want to see a girl's tits. Like, like it's just very childish. It's, yes. <laughs> I get it. I mean, I think, you know, if, you, if it's in person, like, if you're actually at the spring break, like, I can imagine a guy being like, yes, like, show us your tits or whatever. But, like... I mean, not that that's, like, okay, or, you know, but I, but in that environment, I feel like a lot of the girls are down, obviously, because they signed off on, there's so many, like, hundreds, probably thousands of girls that signed off to be in those Girls Gone Wild, so obviously, like, a lot of them are cool with it. But it's also, like, if you think of the cultural thing of, like, you know, I mean, Brazilian people probably would be, like, what? Why would you pay for that? Like, everyone here is so free, and nobody cares, and it's oh, just, yeah. it's just a human <laughs> body, it's just a, a woman's body, what... I had a Swedish roommate, and he was just like, you guys are all prudes. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's just like, yeah, you guys, like, never have sex. And I was just like, what do you mean? Like, how many people have you had sex with? And he's just like, 55. And I was just like, how old are you? And he's like, 24. And I was like, oh, cool, man. Like, righteous. Like <laughs> that, is, that is crazy to me. I don't know. He I was mean, just living with, a, like, a junior in college who had had sex with, like, four or five people and was just like, yeah, nice, cool, man. Like, all right. That's so funny. I mean, I don't judge anyone. Like, you should do whatever you want. But, like, that... That is wild to me. Like, I would never... Like, I would never want to be intimate with that many people. That, like, scares me almost. I'm like, whoa, too many people, like, near my private parts. And not near, you know. Closer yeah. than near. <laughs> yeah. It's just too many people. There, I just, like, I don't... I just don't need that. Anyway. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, just to put a, a button on the Spring Breakers <laughs> talk... There is a lot of, like, college culture that I think just comes down to the idea of, like, the spring break culture and, like, that being on TV and that being, like, on a beach hot culture and, like, hookup culture and, like, drink until you're fucking blackout drunk culture, um, which is why I think Shithouse is good because it goes against a lot of these tendencies that, like, have come from the spring break culture. Because, like, now it feels like when you go to college, you have to be, like, a crazy party or else you don't fit in at college, you know? Yeah. Because that's, it's just like, oh, you gotta go to the frat party, you gotta be crazy, and if you don't be crazy, then nobody's gonna like you, you know? Um, yeah, there's so much, I, it's weird, like, I'm just happy that my college experience wasn't like this, like, yes, I definitely, like, I went to some really good parties, but they were all people that I was, like, really good friends with, and it was, it wasn't, like, you know, 50 people packed into a frat house or something. It was, like, maybe, like, 20 people at my friend's house or whatever, and it was more, like, like, yeah, we, you know, there was, you know, not really, like, drug drugs. There was, like, weed and, you know, obviously people were drinking and stuff, but, like, it was more of a, like, we were already friends, so we already, like, enjoyed each other's company. Like, I'm not really one of those people that would, like, tag along to, like, a huge wild party that I didn't know anybody at just so that I could, like, get wasted and have some crazy adventure which like there's something to be said for that like that's that's great but I don't know I just didn't I mean there's so much like the the generation before ours had like Porky's and Animal House and like those kind of movies and that it's I didn't grow up with those because that was like before but I would hear about them sometimes like when people would talk about like crazy movies or party movies or college movies they would talk about that and like oh my god like can you believe this scene or whatever and I was just like I don't know, that just wasn't what college was like for me. Like, I loved college so much, but I definitely wasn't, like, giving, like, random blowjobs and, like, you know, showing my boobs and whatever. I mean, no shade, again, like, people should do whatever they want, but (laughs) it's just funny. Like, it's interesting to watch in a movie like this, though, that is, like, so different from the kind of Porky's movie. Like, it's just, this movie is, like, 
a dreamy mess if I had to describe it. And that that's like a compliment. <laughs> so. I think it's just popularized hookup culture. Yeah. I think like that's kind of the change that like the college movies over the years have like normalized hookup culture in the mainstream so that it's just like you've been seeing it since the eighties. Like our parents knew that like college was a place to hook up because they were watching movies that were about hooking up in college, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like for us to now be through generations of generations of people seeing this media that's like, oh, you're supposed to be having sex. And that's what college is all about is like finding the person that you have sex with and make babies with so that you can pay taxes to America. <laughs> or having sex with as many people as possible. I feel like especially... The thing is, like, people are always talking about, like, how much pressure is on women and how hard it is for women, and I agree, but, like, I think there's so much pressure on men to, like, there's that documentary, The Mask We Live In, and it's, like, there's so much pressure on men to, like, get women and, like, fuck as many women as possible, and, like, if you have sex with all these women, that makes you cool and that makes you successful and, like, you know, you are, like, a fucking G if you do that, and then if you don't, it's, like, oh, like, you're, oh, you're such a good boy or something, and it's, like, no, it's like, when you want to have sex, have sex. When you want to have sex with different people, have sex with different people. If you want to stay monogamous with someone your whole life, that's fine. And, like, there's just this weird pressure put on men that, like, this is the specific version of success. Like, you have to provide. You have to make all this money. You have to be at this certain place at a certain time. You can't cry. You can't be sensitive. This is this is good for this movie that we're going to talk about. Um, you know, you can't... Um, you know, you have to be a man, like, you have to be good at sports, and you have to be ready to kick someone's ass at any time, and you can't leave a fight, and all these things that are so pushed on you guys, and it's, like, just insane. Like, it, to me, it's just as insane as the stuff that's pushed on women. It's, like, why? And then I think, I think a lot of that comes to a head in college. Because, like, in high school, you're still kind of, like, incubated. You're with your parents. I mean, I lived with my parents throughout college. Um, because I didn't go away for college, but a lot of people do not. A lot of people, they leave, you know, when they're 18 and they're, like, in a different state and they're, like, there's all this pressure, like, you have to have this iconic college experience and it's, like, <laughs> my college experience was amazing. It wasn't really, like, any movie I've seen, but it was still, it was the best, so, yeah. Well, what was the, uh college movie that you picked well there's just there's a few that are really really iconic like my favorite if i had to pick a favorite college movie it would probably be legally blonde but i just don't feel the need to talk about that because it's so overly like everybody loves that movie and it's talked about so much and then of course we talked about this in the last episode the social network i mean i think most people would probably say that is like the best college movie of all time that or maybe like goodwill hunting these are both movies that i've like never thought of as college movies just because like the main characters i feel like do so much above me. Like, Legally Blonde, definitely, like, I just, I, I think of her as, like, passing the bar. You know, like, I don't think of right. her as being in school. I think of her as being a lawyer at the end. But, like, also the social network, I'm like, oh, the Facebook guy. Like, I don't think of it as college, but, like, it, it is, is the in yeah. the essence. He was ranking hot girls. That was how Facebook started. I know. <laughs> it's so crazy. Which, like, I'm glad that that's in that movie because, like, I feel like people wouldn't know that whatsoever. So, like, it's at least it's good that that fact is in, like, mm -hmm. the movie that's about the founding of Facebook. Yeah. So the movie I actually picked is a lesser-known movie from the ones I just mentioned, and it is called The Rules of Attraction. Mm -hmm. It is based on the... Brett East and Ellis book of the same name that came out in 1987. It's directed by Roger Avery. And this movie is truly, to me, interesting and groundbreaking on another level. Now, it came out when I was way too young to see it. Way too, like, not even in the neighborhood of, like, how old I was. In fact, one time when I was watching it, I watched it over and over. My dad overheard what was going on and came into my room and was like, what the hell are you watching? Oh my god, because... The dialogue is very frank. I mean, it's Brett Easton Ellis. If you know anything about this person, you're going to understand what I'm saying. So, um, it has a bunch of, like, big stars, like, like teen, early 20s stars of the time, like, uh, James Vanderbeek playing completely against type. This is a whole other, it's completely different from Dawson's Creek, like, not even, like, almost unrecognizable, you know? Um, Shannon Sossaman, Jessica Biel, uh, Ian Summerholder. This is the first time I actually saw him in anything. And... Um, so three of the characters have, like, inner monologue. The main character is played by James Vanderbeek, uh, Sean Bateman, and, um, it's just none of the characters are really likable. Um, it's, this movie is, I don't want to call it gritty, but it's just, uh, it's, like, not nice. I, I don't know how else to, to put it, and it's, and it's, like, the best adaptation of a Brett Easton Ellis novel, because it's, 
like it's all over the place. It's experimental. It is sometimes meandering. It sometimes there's scenes that you're just like, why is this even here? And then other time there's scenes just that like knock your socks off and are amazing. I think the needle drops are so good. I love the soundtrack. I think all of the actors work really well together. Um, it jumps around in time a little bit, which I think is awesome. Um, and it's really like, it just shows the way that people treat each other when they just don't, it's like, they treat each other badly, but you kind of understand almost like you don't like them. Or, but sometimes some of the stuff they say is just so relatable. Like when I was younger, I think I watched a lot of like cliche stuff. And then when I started to see movies like this, that would have just like really frank, honest di dialogue, like the kind of dialogue that people don't actually say, but you know, like you're thinking it. And at the time, like I was so young when I watched this that I didn't even like, I didn't even get it. I was just interested in it because it was so different and then as I got older and I started to be like a teenager I was like oh like I understand this more now like I get these relationships I get you know I get this like these this like narcissism or this like desperation or whatever and um yeah the the camera work too is really experimental and interesting like they they just took risks with this movie it's just not your typical movie and part of it like some of it is really gross and really like you know um unnecessarily like I don't know, uh, bloody or, or, or maybe not unnecessarily. I don't know. Um, there's, you know, some violent things in it. There's a lot of, there's some scenes where like, there's so much cursing that it's like, it's almost as if they were like, so this is a Brett Easton Ellis adaptation. <laughs> right. right. Like, like, you know what I mean? It's just like, it's just, um, you know, obviously there's like sex scenes and stuff that are just like, ugh, like kind of hard to get through and things like that. But, um, I, I've always really appreciated this movie. I haven't watched it in a while. Now I'm, I'm making myself really want to rewatch it. I have the DVD at home. Um, it's just, I love it. And I really like the performances. Like, James Vanderbeek to me, like, I've literally only seen him in Dawson's Creek, but... He's really great in What Would Diplo Do? I have... Wait, are you serious? I haven't seen this. Um, it's, a, it's literally like a mockumentary show where he plays Diplo. Oh my god, okay, okay, I heard about it. It was on Vice Land. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've barely seen him in anything else, and like like I said, this is he, he'll always be Dawson, like everyone will always say that, um, but his performance in this is just so, like, it, it's just so, you like, you hate him, he's so gross and awful, uh, but yet you can't take your eyes off of him either, you know, and um, I love Ian Summerholder in this, it's such a good role, and like, uh, that Faye Dunaway has a cameo. Like, this movie is just, oh, like... Wow. <laughs> it's just all over the place. And um, I just... I, you know what I love about this movie? I could sum up. I love the energy of this movie. It's very specific. It's it's uncommon. And I think... I just think it's worth watching for any any adult. It's not... I saw it way too young. But, you know what I mean? <laughs> Set up realistic expectations for the world. Absolutely. Oh, and Kit Pardue. So good in it. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. Love. I'll have to check this film out. You, I think you would really like it because you appreciate when things are different and like, it, it's all, you know what it is? It's a very Aries movie because it's like so, <laughs> it's like all over the place. Uh, yeah, but that'll bring us into Shit House, our review. And before we get started with the actual movie, I just want to say that this is possibly the worst named movie of all time. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm all for vulgarity when need be. I mean, I don't even think shit is that vulgar of a word, but like. It's just so not appropriate. Um, it just does not at all represent the movie in any way. It's just so weird. I definitely have a different take on that, but really, yeah, we can keep going. It's yeah. just like because this movie is so like tender and like raw emotion, and I just it's just not like when I hear shit house, and actually like the poster too. It's like the two of them, like the two lead characters, and they're clearly like at a party. So if you just look at the poster and hear the the title, like it just seems to me, I would I would think that it was more of like a Porky's or something. It just I don't know. What's oh, your yeah. take on it? That's that's interesting. Uh, I think the title is I. I was are we like going into the film or are we just talking about impressions? No, like let's go. Of, let's okay. let's do it. Well, I was just going to say that, like, I thought the script was really well done. And I think, like, a lot of, like, it feels like this was worked through in a fucking screenplay cr class. Like, as I was watching it, I was like, yes, this is a very good script. This mm -hmm. man has 
definitely workshop the script because like there were a lot of choices that I think he made in the script that I was like, oh, that has like double meaning. Like that's really, that's a good choice. Uh, which like you usually don't have that. And it's also a good story where you're not distracted by it. Like, I feel like more often than not, like you're distracted by things like that where you're like, oh, I see what they did there. Ah, ah, ah. Um, but I think there is like the aspect of it being called shit house where it is like, you go to this house that you think is a shit house, and then you end up finding the person that you fall in love with, kind of a thing, which is like very true about college sometimes, is or you think you find somebody that you love at a shit house, you know? Like I think that is uh, definitely for people who partied in college. Like, oh yeah, like I went to the craziest party ever, and then I found somebody who like was actually really nice and chill, and like. Mm -hmm. I think that's, like, people don't expect that. They expect to find shitty people there. And then also, I think, like, the family aspects of the film and, like, yeah. both of the members of that couple and, like, where they came from with their family. And, like, I think everybody, when they go off to college, like, if they go off to college, like, they're trying to escape something sometimes and, like, they're trying to get out of a shit house one way or another, like he lost his dad and she had like other family issues and like both of them thought that they're like leaving a bad family or something like that. Well, he also feels a little homesick, so he doesn't necessarily feel a like little, a little bit, <laughs> but like, it's not that he's like leaving his family, leaving his bad family, but like he had a bad situation that happened to him, you know, yeah. like he's had loss. And I think that is like the double entendre of it is like, yeah, like, sometimes you go to a shit house and you find love, you know? Like, sometimes uh, your roommate shits his pants, and that's just the house that you're living in. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting take. Thank you for sharing that, because I like it a little bit more now. I'm still not 100% sold, but I appreciate your perspective on it. So, the, I think, like, the reason why I love this movie so much, first of all, it's just good. Like, in, in all ways, it is just a good movie. I love the performances. And I love the script, like you're saying, and I mean, I just, I, I just, overall, like, across the board, I don't really have much criticism for it. But I think the reason why I love this movie so much is because this was, I, again, like, I wasn't homesick in my college experience because I didn't leave. I lived with my parents. But um, the aspect of, like, just the two of them meeting and, like, hanging out all night and that being the thing, like, the party not being the thing, but, like, that being the thing... I feel like for me, like, the best part of the party is, like, when it's, like, at its peak, but you're not, you're, like, in a room with somebody that you've met, and you're not hooking up, it's just, like, you're just, like, talking, and, like, getting to know each other, and you're both, maybe you've both had, like, nobody's wasted, like, maybe you've both, like, smoked a little bit, and you're, like, in a vibe, or maybe you've had, each had, like, a couple drinks, but you're not, wait, like, it's not, like, a woohoo, like, fucking crazy party, it's just, like, it's just, like, two people connecting, and you just have a moment, and, like, it's not even, it doesn't even have to be, like, a, an attraction, like, that is in this movie, obviously, they're attracted to each other, and, uh, and all of that. It doesn't have to be that. Like, I've had it more just with friends, you know, and it's just, like, I, I just love that. Like, to me, those are the moments. Like, the partying stuff is just not my vibe. I don't really drink, so, like, uh, so I'm just not there, but, um, speaking of, like, attraction and, and sex and everything, um, I love that the first time they try to have sex, they can't. Like, it just doesn't really work. And then later on, after they've had this, like, amazing, like, connection and they've gotten to know each other, then they have, like, this great sex, I assume. Like, because that, to me, is, like, I am not, like, a one-night stand kind of person. Like, I would never, like, the way that they just, like, jumped into bed, like, I would never do that. Yeah. Again, like, no shade to anyone who does that um, at all. But that's just not my vibe. So, like, I'm one of those people who's, like, the connection between two people is what makes sex good, not... Like, oh, this person's hot and I just met them 15 minutes ago. You know what I mean? Like, that's not at all my thing. Like, I probably wouldn't enjoy that. So, um, that to me, like, just, just the way that he decided to portray that, that, like, when they first start hooking up, it doesn't work. And then once they really know each other, it does. That, that to me is just, like, such a good... And they don't... It's not heavy-handed. Like, they don't have to say it. Like, it's not... In the next scene, it's not like, wow, you know, like, blah, 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 or whatever. It's just, like... That's that just also, something for you to observe, you know? That's also so the dichotomy of, like, college sex is, like, everybody watches, like, 
college movies and they're just like everybody's having sex so like when I go to college I gotta have sex but like there is so like the inexperienced spectrum where you're just like ah no uh, I don't wanna have sex uh, I don't know yeah. sex and like don't expect that but then there's also so many people who like go to college and they're just like I had sex in high school like I'm gonna have sex with as many people as possible because after this like there is never having sex with people ever again because I'm gonna be married you know Uh like there's really both ends of the spectrum and I think a lot of people struggle with that and I don't think it's been portrayed like as well as it was here that like yeah there are some women who just want to like hook up with people and not have connections. And then there's some guys who don't want to do that. (laughs) Right. This was a role reversal. So usually what's portrayed in movies, I mean, now things are changing, right? Like things have been changing the past like 10 years probably. But usually in a movie like this, it would be the girl who after they have sex is like, oh my God, like why isn't he calling me or, you know, like whatever. And in this movie, it's a role reversal where he is like, genuinely confused because they obviously really connected like this isn't a movie where he's like delusional and he thinks that like this girl's like crazy about him and she's not it's like she's obviously just scared and she has her own emotional issues that are you know stopping her from really acknowledging this and so instead she's just very defensive and she's just like whoa dude like whatever we hooked up it's no big deal and it's like i feel like my stand-up was plagiarized by this movie oh my god i feel like my life was plagiarized by this movie (laughs) But, yeah, so (laughs) this movie to me is so remarkable and so different and so beautiful because of the way that it portrays a man who is crying and is so homesick that he calls his mom and sister every single day and cries when he's on the phone with them and he can't even express in words how he feels and how much he misses them. He only can cry and, you know despite this again like there's this pressure in college like oh you're gonna meet the best friends of your life you're gonna have the best time ever and he's just not meeting anybody really and he he makes up a person so that his mom doesn't worry about him as much like what a sweetie I, you know what I mean yeah. I, I wonder if he just made this movie so that maybe everything we're saying is uh, maybe maybe this whole thing is just fake and he just wants to get girls because obviously after seeing this I was like oh I love him <laughs> but um but yeah the the but also, this the guy who made this film went to film school. Yeah. And was probably a guy in high school who stayed at home and watched a lot of films. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, which is an archetype that we relate to a lot. <laughs> it's like this idea of being an introvert and people not really getting us and being like, oh, well, like, we just watch a lot of artsy things and, like, people don't ask us what we think. But, like, we know that we think interesting things, you know? <laughs> I just love the the stunning lack of hesitation and fear in portraying this character the way that he did. And he's such a good actor. I mean, man, similar to what I was saying in the last episode, like with Wells, like if he had only acted in Citizen Kane and done nothing else, I still would have been insanely impressed. I feel the same way about um, Cooper Rape in this movie. I, I love his performance. It's so natural. You, you don't even... Sometimes this movie feels like they just kind of went into someone's room and started filming without them knowing. Like, it's just... Very consent positive. Yes, yes, exactly. That that Which, is so like, important. In the, Me Too, in the Me Too era, it's good that a college movie uh, has very clear consent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry if I disrupted you. No, train. you didn't. You didn't. It's just so hard for me to even articulate how I feel about this movie because I feel like, well, it was supposed to premiere at South by Southwest this year, but obviously that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. And so it went to... Um, VOD and it's so worth the six dollars guys look seriously I really want to watch it again actually I wish it was just unless you're on your parents uh cable plan still because then it's going to be on IFC eventually (laughs) yeah (laughs) eventually um but yeah I mean I can't even imagine what a bright future this guy has because oh you know what happened I I forgot about this he got involved with um the brothers Duplass brothers Uh... so that's how this happened but um but still, it's like they, you know, they picked him out of every other person that's desperately sending them scripts and begging them to help. So, uh, I mean, it was just so, I, I just love all the little details in it, too. And it kind of reminds me of one of my favorite, I it's weird to even call it a franchise, but the Before movies. Um, mm, this, I still need to watch all of those. You, wait, you haven't seen any of them? I, I think they're on one of the streaming services I have on my TV. I gotta watch them. I don't know if they're on HBO Max or something else. But did you watch the first one? I haven't watched any of them. 
I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I feel, I, I like, I definitely looked at like the description of like one of them at a time and would be like, ah, oh, like, I don't know if I want to watch this right now. But then once I realized that they were like a series, then I just didn't want to watch them out of order. And then it was don't, hard no, for no, me no, to no. just find them. Yeah, no, no, no. I, this I, is... I was worried that I was going to do that. That's one of those that you have to watch first one first, second one second, third one third. Like, I, I would, I, my heart would be broken, especially because you're such a big film fan if you watch them out of sequence. So yeah. But they're some of my favorite movies ever, and the fir- this movie is similar to Before Sunrise. Like, there's no possible way that he didn't take inspiration from that movie for this, because that that movie, it's in a totally different setting, and it's in a different time period and all mm. of that, but it's about two people that basically spend the whole night walking around and talking to each other, and that is very similar to this. And, uh, yeah, like, I love... All, they. There's little, like, strange details in this movie, and not even strange, but just, like, human details in this movie that make them feel more like actual people and characters, you know what I mean? Whereas some, you know, so many movies are just so stylized, and even when they're not trying to be, it's like the person writing them is just not that good of a writer. So it's like the person doesn't feel like a real person. They just feel like a character. And, it's, you know, like the fact that she, like, I think it's so funny, the whole premise of, like, you know, she has this turtle, and then she, uh, it dies, and she p- throws it away, and he, like, thinks that's insane. And she's like, what do you mean? It's like, it's dead, or, you know, whatever. And he's like, no, like, we have to bury it, you know? Which that also reminded me a lot of Garden State, which is a movie that is so reviled, but I adore. Like, it's one of my top ten movies, so I don't get that. But um, there's a very similar scene in Garden State uh, where um, Natalie Portman's uh, hamster dies and jelly and they they bury and it's the first night it's the first day that those two meet Zach Braff and Natalie Portman in that movie so it's it's has a similar vibe and so it was this movie was clearly inspired by movies that I love so much and mm, yeah. I really wasn't even offended by the way that he borrowed from them because I do feel like he made it his own and we're all just well, kind of he's about to get borrowed from a ton because like people are gonna watch this film and he like cracked a code it's like oh yeah. okay so that's how we're supposed to be portraying college kind of like how Garden State cracked, like, the hipster indie code, and then after Mm -hmm. that, everybody kind of took, like, oh, I have to be super unique and, like, do something that nobody else has ever done before and, like, Mm -hmm. fit into my tiny little box and scream into the dumpster because it's still beautiful, you know? (laughs) Right. Well, and also, like, this movie also, um, because I feel like, obviously throughout, like, Hollywood history, um, you know, but even even more recently, like, women in movies that were, that was the attractive lead woman, like, very glamorous, you know, even when she wakes up in the morning, clearly has makeup on, like, it's just so unrealistic and stuff, and, you know, is, like, a skinny, blonde, you know, girl with, like, big boobs or something, and, you know, um, there's, like, a beautiful, you know, face with very manicured, very, you know, all of that, and then in Garden State, it's, like, obviously Natalie Portman is a gorgeous girl, but she's, like, so dressed down, she's wearing, like, Converse and, you know, like, baggy jeans and not really makeup, and she's just, like, a normal girl, and I feel like that's, Garden State is one of those movies that ushered in, like, the, the normal everyday girl, who we all know is a gorgeous movie star, but she's just, like, pared down a little bit, she's, like, more relatable, and so, like, that yeah, it's was good this- that Zach Braff made that film, so now he could date Florence Pugh. <laughs> a very beautiful woman. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, she is. She is. Um, so many people have a problem with this relationship. I don't know how much older he is, but, like, I don't know. I, I bet they're not even going to be dating still. Like, yeah, is I this, feel like is that was probably just a love? fling. Yeah, it was probably just a fling. <laughs> like, it probably just got blown out of proportion by tabloids and stuff like that, and now she's probably on movies that far away, and they're probably not dating anymore. <laughs> no, they're still together. Like, they post about each other. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, I don't know what's going to happen there, but, um, but yeah, so this movie too, like the, he, w- wait, one last thing. Yeah. <laughs> he has like Bojack relevance. Like he's like as relevant as like Bojack Horseman in some ways because of Scrubs. <laughs> like, <laughs> wait, what do you mean? <laughs> like, it's just like funny, like, cause like he's like dating somebody who definitely like watched Scrubs. Like, like yeah. Scrubs is that popular. So like if you date somebody that's young, like, you know, they've watched your show in, like, a weird way, Mm -hmm. you know? Like, it's a difference between, besides, like, oh, like, I saw your film, and, like, you're a great filmmaker, but then it's also, like, oh, yeah, I, like, grew up watching you after school. When I would come home from school, I would watch Scrubs. (laughs) Like, that's how old Florence Pugh is. Like, she was Comedy Central, like, afternoon Scrubs. (laughs) Yeah. I I feel like I don't have that much of a problem with the relationship, because I think, if I'm not mistaken, if if I'm wrong... Yeah, it's fine. Like, if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm wrong, but I think she's, like, 26 or 27, 
if she was like 20, because I don't know, because obviously like the legal age is 18, right, to date someone older, um, I think she's English, right, so for her it's probably 16, but she didn't know him then. Um, oh, well in England you could be 13 and date adults, because they have different laws <laughs> in Europe. <laughs> no, but I think the, the age of consent... Well, in some parts of America, I think the age of consent is 16, right? But definitely in Europe. Mm, I don't know if that's the case in America anymore. I think maybe I at know. some point. Yeah. But either way, it doesn't. it's irrelevant to this because she's like 25, 26, 27 in there. And he's like 46, maybe, like around there. Um, I have a phone right here. I can look it up, but I just don't care enough. Um, and like, it wouldn't be a comedy podcast if we fact check things. Right, exactly. <laughs> and for me, I think once you hit like 25... I feel like even if you're dating a 50-year-old, like, you're 25. You, you've you lived enough, like... Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, that person could still be taking advantage of you, but you could also be taking advantage of that person, too, for whatever, like, they have that you want, um, or Once whatever. it's a realistic age that you could, like, die of a drug overdose, like, I feel like that's when you could start dating anybody. Because it's like, oh, I could die tomorrow, like, Jordan? does it fucking matter? Oh, my God. Because, <laughs> like, if you could join the 27 Club, then it's like... Oh, well, like, you could have just never dated somebody in the 27 Club because they were too young. <laughs> um, I am not okay. <laughs> so, um... Because, like, if somebody, if somebody was a genius, you would know they were a genius by the time they were 20. 22 oh, oh. or 24, that's what I'm saying. Okay, like, she's 24, so that's... I said 25 was kind of my cutoff, so whatever. Wait, let me see how old he is. 45 and 24, that's not that. I mean, it's not amazing. Like, it doesn't thrill me. If my my cousin is 20, and if she, when she's 24, if she was dating a 45-year-old, I would definitely be like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? But I don't know. I feel like Hollywood is kind of different, because, like, you start work. I mean, she probably started working when she was so young, and it's like... it's The thing is, it's not like she's a teenager or something. I don't know. Yeah, also, Zach Braff is known for being a sensitive guy, and there's never been a sensitive guy who's been manipulative and me too, eh? No. <laughs> oh my God. no, I'm sorry. Jordan's on fire, you guys. Go see, when, when's your show? Wednesday? Uh, Wednesdays <laughs> at uh, Late Night Hump at New Jersey Weed Man's Joint. You won't regret it. Um, no, yeah. Uh, but we should get back to Shithouse, because that's what this is really about. We it's should. not about trashing Zach Braff so that Flores Pugh leaves him for me, and then I have to figure out my messy relationship because... Florence Pugh is single again. Um, Rena is so much better than her. No, so shout out to Rena. I joke. No, but, <laughs> but that's the thing. Rena approves of me dating Florence Pugh. So. Oh, is she your hall pass? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think oh, yeah. how sweet. Who's Rena's? Clark Gable. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot who it was. I forgot who her hall pass was. That's Shia funny. LaBeouf is somebody who we have a threesome with. Ooh, I would love to see that. <laughs> film it, that'd be great. Yeah, no, Shia LaBeouf is super attractive. Like, no matter what he's, like, has happened, I know that he's had some, you know, he's had some issues and everything, and he's, you know, whatever. Um, I, he's still, like, I was attracted to him when I was literally, like, a child, and he was in um, Even Stevens on Disney Channel, and then, like, in Holes and everything, and now as an adult, too, I'm just like, he's, he's just an attractive person. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um... Anyway, so report back to me and let me know how that threesome is. I will let you know. Yeah, and if I'm single at the time, you definitely can, like, just let him know that and give him my address. Anyway, so Shithouse. I think this movie is, like, painfully awkward in a way that's, like, so cathartic. It's of the times also. Like, a lot of the awkwardness is very much the cell phone generation's awkwardness. Yeah, where you just pull out your phone because you don't know what to say. You just pretend that you're looking at something and you're scrolling and you just don't, that you're not processing anything that you're seeing. You just want to look busy so that you don't have to talk. I've done that um, <laughs> many times. Uh, I also have awkwardly just stood in a girl's dorm room and just been like, uh, Hey, like, cool, we're hanging out, right? Like, just, yeah. like, standing off to the side, like, am I allowed to sit down? Like, <laughs> right, right. Exactly that. And, like, when he says, um, or, which one about, I'm having trouble remembering. I watched this movie, like, three weeks ago now. Or maybe more. I don't, what is time? Anyway, um, I think that, like, he gets up to leave after they, like, fail at hooking up. Or, 
or wait, or maybe it's when they do hook up, they, they do end up having sex and he's like, oh, like, I guess I'll go or whatever. And she's like, oh, you can like stay if you like, that would be, I would like want you to stay or whatever. And he's like, oh, I like, I thought I had to, like, I totally want to stay. I, I would love to stay. You know what I mean? Like I felt that way so many times because I'm like a very intense person. So I'm usually, unless I really don't like the person, I'm not going to be the one who's like, okay, I have to go home. Like, even if I have like work in the morning or something, if I'm enjoying myself, I'm just like, you know what? You only live once, whatever. Like, let's hang out. Um, and so I feel that way all the time where I'm like, oh, I should probably like leave. You know, I should probably just be like, oh, I have to go or whatever. And, um, when you finally like meet that person who, um, you know, like there's a very, this very special person in my life where like I had, you know, a night similar to this and, um, and he was just like, I am not going to be the one to end this. So like, if you want to leave, like you should say that because I'm not going to do that. And I was like, oh my God, someone who's on my level. Hi. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's like, clearly like they, they meet and they have that bond where like after they kind of establish that where she's like, no, I want you to say, and he's like, okay. Like, um, the comfort that these two have with each other right away is just so lovely and there should just be more college movies about what it's like actually like to be a person instead of just being like woohoo I'm just gonna get drunk and get laid every day it's like okay congratulations <laughs> what well, was very accurate portrayal of dating an RA RAs are very down-to-earth people oh did you date an RA I did date an RA sweet my early college girlfriend was an RA and like I started dating her while she was like the RA of my like the floor that I was on my sophomore or my freshman year, she was the RA of that floor when we were both sophomores. Like she was the same year as me, so she wasn't my RA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but no, like there is also like this RA like vibe that's very much like I know I know how all this shit works. Like I know I know how life yeah. works, and like I think that was a very good device that was like oh, well, like, this person knows everything about life, and she knows how to hook up, and she knows how college works, but then, like, once the death stuff came up, then that's when, like, it was like, oh, well, it how do you real. feel about death? How do you feel about, like, what happens next? Like, mm -hmm. really dark shit, which is, like, really why you go to college, you yeah. know? It's to, like, think about that intellectually, think about right, it emotionally. Go a little deeper. Do some drugs, yeah. get a little too drunk so that you think too deeply and do it, you know? <laughs> yeah, and it's like, you... You know, we see so many people throughout the day. Like, there's so many people in college. I actually went to three different colleges, so there's so many people that I saw every day that I wasn't really friends with, and then all of a sudden, one time, you end up, like, thrown together because you're doing some project or you're at a party or something, and then you start talking to them, and you're like, oh, my God, like, I've seen this person every day, but now they're telling me about how, like, their dad died, and I'm like, wow, this person is walking around holding this, like, horrible thing that happened to them, and you would never know it, but then you sit down and talk to them, and it just makes you realize, like, how much everybody around us is you know coping with whatever they're coping with and uh it, it's it's beautiful when you actually stop and listen and get to know somebody on that level and it's just so beautiful because uh, I love this movie because he he needs it so badly that's why it's so good is because he's so like he, they're not afraid to you know Cooper's not afraid to go there with his writing and, and acting is like He's not afraid to show how, like, desperate he is to not be lonely and how much he's hurting and how much he's definitely not living up to this whatever college is supposed to be. I mean, he's not even hitting hitting it anywhere near where he feels like he should or whatever. And um, There's also the loneliness of him thinking that he's not feeling the right way. Right, You right. know, like, when you go to college, a lot of people feel lonely and a lot of people feel homesick, but they're made to think, like everybody's having a great time. Why am I not having a great time? Like, everybody's going out partying. Everybody has tons of friends. Like, I have a ton of, tons of friends. Why not? Why not? Why, why am I not yeah. having a good time, you know? And it's like everyone, like, everyone feels that they don't have friends. Like, everyone feels like they're awkward. Everyone feels like they're not cool enough. Everyone feels like they're not attractive enough at some point. Like, yeah, we all have good moments, but, like, I think especially college, because you're just so, you're just like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, that, that, that era is just so interesting. Yeah, and I know, like, my college, not to be, like, a downer, but, like, my college specifically, like, was a very big party school, but it was also a very big suicide school. Like, there were oh a lot of people who committed suicide for, like, being a very small school. And it's just, like, a lot of people have, like, terrible things going on beneath the surface that they can't feel comfortable talking to people about because everybody's just like, why are you being a downer now? Like, really? You had to bring that up right now, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Like, people don't feel comfortable bringing up dark shit sometimes because mm -hmm. it's, like... It brings the mood down, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. and it's, 
taboo sometimes depending on what your dark shit is you know like a lot of people came from like places where like you don't know if they were abused by their parents you don't know like if they've been sexually assaulted you don't know if they've been through this or that or have a drug issue now like that's also another thing that happened at my college a lot which like very similar experience to his i went very far away and like people at tulane in general were like very from far away there weren't a lot of people from louisiana who went to tulane like that was maybe the fifth or sixth most populous state represented oh, in two wow. So, like, most people were far from home. So, like, a lot of people were homesick. A lot of people got so tripped out on drugs that, like, they had to go home for a semester or two. They had to drop out of college because they were so homesick. And, wow. like, that partying culture, like, seeing your roommate come home drunk and, like, you could either look at that and be like, ah, I don't want to do that. But if you're sad, you look at that and you're like, ah, what did I miss out on? He looks like he did something, you know? Yeah. There, um, there, there's, I, like, this happened before college, but, um, my parents separated when I was 13, and I, I was fine with it because, like, my dad didn't bail or anything, he just moved to another place, and I saw him, and it was fine, and, like, I knew my parents shouldn't, like, be together, so it was fine, but, um, like, a year after that, I was at my friend's house, and, um, it was me, her, her boyfriend at the time, and then our other, like, girlfriend, and, um, we all were just hanging out, and then her parents got into this huge fight, like, because of something she did, I can't remember, and it was really bad, like, they were just, like, didn't care that we were there, and that had never happened before, and it was just, like, like, exposed, like, you know, for this situation, and, um, she was crying on the bed, like, because she was so upset and, like, embarrassed, too, that we had seen it, and I was, like, um, I was, like, it's okay, you know, my parents used to fight like this, too, and, She's like, my parents were like on the verge of divorce. Like nobody like knows how bad it is. And then her boyfriend said, mine too. And then our other friend said, mine too. And I was like, my parents are separated. So <laughs> like, it was like, we all had the same problem and none of us were talking about it, even though we were all really close. Like she was like my best friend. And then obviously her and her boyfriend were super close. And like, it was just, it was like, why don't we just like let down our weird masks and shells that we live in and just be real because it's like how many people around us you know and their parents are just staying together because whatever they're too lazy to get divorced and they're just you know they get vicious with each other and it's like at that point I guess you know I'm actually pretty sure that her parents are still together so that's interesting but at that point you know things were so bad that they literally just they didn't even care about being like really heinous to each other right in front of us and it's like she's dealing with that, like, let's just talk about it, you know, and after that happened, like, we would talk about it a lot, and, like, we, you know, it was better for both of us, you know, and it's, like, when you take that time, like, they do in this movie to really connect and get to know someone, it's, like, just better for both of you, because you just feel so much less alone. Yeah, and I think also we have a tendency to assume that everything's gonna break nicely, and, like, everything happens perfectly, and you'll know when everything starts and when everything ends and it'll be labeled all nicely. And like, that's not what life is, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, it's easy to think that like, oh, it's possible to be married and last forever, you know? Uh -huh. But like, the realistic nature of it is like, people move in and out of each other's lives. And like, some people get married and realize that they're not meant for each other, you know? And like, if that was more taught on like, a grander scale that like kind of like yeah like you should enjoy the people while they're in your life but like sometimes people come and they go but like it's so right. shown that like oh my gosh if your family falls apart your family falls apart and like everything is over and like the people who are going through the divorce themselves are like wow i'm fucking up my family right now by doing this because that's what the media tells them also yeah or religion <laughs> yeah or and religion. other like organized you know situations it, yeah, I think in general there should just be so much less of a stigma on divorce. It's so funny. I'm like, oh my god. Like, I just think it's so... I mean, it's not funny. I, I have empathy for people going through that who want to get divorced and feel like they can't. I Like, I'm, I'm sorry if you're in that situation. That's horrible. But in like we it just it's just indicative of the bigger problem that we're all talking about which is like we all grow up with these ideas that are pushed on us and then we think that's how the world is and then you know all it takes like I'm lucky because I consumed so much like movies and books and tv and I was like obsessed and I think a lot of people you know people equate books with learning and then tv is like oh it's just running your brain but I actually feel like I learned so much because I watched so many different types of movies that like I I would see things like the rules of attraction, which was like this completely different kind of dialogue or, 
you know, just other kinds of cultures, other kinds of people, like other, you know, making hard decisions, but doing it for the right reasons or whatever, or, you know, things like that. It just exposed me to have a much more open mind because I was seeing so many different types of people go through so many different types of things that I never would have seen. So, but at the same time, I was like exposed to a lot of stuff too that like made me think that things are supposed to be a certain way, especially like, you know, being an actress and thinking that like I have to be a certain weight or like I have to look a certain way when I go to an audition or I have to like have a certain thing in order to be like better than this other person. Then it's like, why are we competing? This is so stupid. <laughs> like all that kind of stuff. It looks like we're back into shit house. Yes. Um, we got cut off when we were talking about Jordan's um, impotence. Uh, <laughs> it is weird. Yeah, it just totally killed the mood. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. You, I mean, not that I would know, but we're just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but now we are back uh, with hopefully enough time left on this damn recorder to finish off our shit house talk. Uh, what was there anything specific that you wanted to touch on that you don't think we've gotten? deep into yes i want to do spoilers okay spoilers 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 if you have not seen it i mean this isn't like you know this isn't the sixth sense you're not gonna you know it's not gonna ruin the movie but you know if you haven't seen it yet and you want you don't want to know what happens at the end then skip ahead or just turn it off so okay what do you think about the ending the flash forward and uh i like the ending <laughs> because uh i think that is the realistic nature of love is that you don't necessarily love somebody the first time you meet them. You don't necessarily love them the second time you meet them. You don't necessarily love them, like, three or four weeks into knowing them. Uh, maybe you love them two and a half years later. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was just an interesting uh, way to end it. Like, obviously, it is, like, the romantic comedy, like, happy ending. Like, oh, you will end up with the cute person who you thought that you might be good for at mm -hmm. one point. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, I think, uh, like, you shouldn't rush love, mm -hmm. you know? And also, people are right for each other at different times in their lives, you know? And a lot of times, you meet the person when you're at a, the wrong point in your life. Or vice versa. Mm -hmm. I think that's more the thing that I have an issue with the tied up bow at the end is like, are they the same people? Have they been friends all of college? Or yeah. are they just meeting up for the first time? I think the implication was they've been friends for a while and then all of a sudden she was ready to date him. But I don't know if that is completely what we're supposed to think. I like that that's ambiguous. If I had to guess, though, I would say that they've been friends on and off they've had periods where they were closer they had periods where they weren't talking they probably hooked up a few more times they probably had sex a few more times and but it's never been a solid thing and maybe they've even had more weird moments where like you know they've hooked up and then he thought like oh now she's like I've cracked her shell and maybe now she'll like open up to me and then she doesn't again or maybe even vice versa maybe he's like maybe she at, at some point was like hey like I like you or whatever and he was like nervous because she had been so weird before and he didn't want to get his heart broken or something like that. You know, he's really sensitive. So I don't know, but I love the idea that because she had so many, you know, she couldn't let her guard down to just like let him love her or whatever, or date her, you know, she couldn't, she was too scared. And I think that it kind of makes sense that like two years later or whatever, I think, was it two years Whatever, at the end of yeah, college. Yeah, two and a half years later. Yeah, it's like, by then, he probably proved himself to her without even trying. He was just being himself, if I had to assume, this is my narrative. He was just being himself and multiple times did not uh, hurt her. Did not, over time, she's realizing, like, okay, like... Because I assume that she, you know, because she has sex with that other guy, too, so I assume that she was pretty, like... You know, I don't want to use the word loose. That's, like, so, like, rude. But I don't know. Like, she was just very free. Like, she didn't, you know, she had sex with a lot of people, basically. So, um, she probably had sex with a lot more guys after becoming his friend. And, like, they probably hurt her. Some of them. Maybe some of them didn't. Maybe she had a good relationship in there. Who knows? But, um, she realized, probably, that he was there with her through it all. And his reaction to her saying, like, I want you to be my boyfriend is so great. Because he's, like, 
well, duh, like, obviously I want to be your boyfriend, you know? Um, he doesn't say it like that. He <laughs> says it. But also, yeah, the first, the first one night stand that, like, you think is more than it is will stick with you forever. But <laughs> then can. after that one, you'll never fall for it again. And then you'll never, like, fall for somebody on a one-night stand again because it'll be ruined for you, you know? Like, yeah. there there were definitely people in college who I was like, oh, wow, are we going to be dating now? This is so cool. And then they were not about it. Aww. And I was like, oh, okay. But, like, if they came around to me, like, two and a half years later, I would have probably been like, oh, yeah, like, sure. Like, I still thought you were, I still think you're cool. You yeah. know? <laughs> like, like, there is a part of it where, like, if you're both mature then, like, you can come around to things later and be like, oh, they just needed time to come around to it. I think, like, a lot of it's immaturity to be like, well, you didn't like me in this moment, so then how could you like me now? Yeah. Which, like, I've also probably been a victim of saying shit like that. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's very, it's like what you were saying before, is sometimes people meet and it's not the right time. It's not, like, it has nothing to do with the person. It's not like she didn't like him or something. It was just that they weren't aligned in that moment to be together and she hadn't experienced the things that she had to experience in order to like have an adult serious relationship where she wasn't afraid that the person was going to disappear or something because that's probably what she was dealing with right is like I don't want to get too close to someone because I might lose them so I and I also love the other kind of spoiler is that you know he makes the decision to stop contacting his family as much because he knows that he has to kind of stand on his own two feet and um, I don't want to say be a man like in a, in a manly sense, but I just mean like, you know, be a man as in like a grown up, you know, person who's not uh, calling mom every day. You know, you can call your mom every day if it's a healthier thing and you're not crying constantly and you're not lying to her about having friends. But if you are in that situation where you know you have to kind of break off a little bit, then I think that was a really wise and mature decision to make, even though it really hurt him to do that. And I'm sure, like, that also probably put him in a better position, too, even though he was ready to have a relationship with her, you know, throughout the course of the movie, and she wasn't. I think it probably did help him in his life and cause him to be more of a grown-up and to stand on his own two feet and have his own, like, autonomy and identity, aside from, like, I miss my mom, you know? Um, it's perfectly fine to miss your mom, I would miss my mom a lot if I went, if I didn't live in the same, like, area as her, so I totally relate, but, uh, I think, you know, it was just one of those cases where you had to have other things happen in your life first. You have to live your life, because, like, you're living your family's life, then you're living your school's life, and then you're living your friend's life, and then you're living a partner's life, you know? Like, if you never get the opportunity to truly live your own life, then I don't think you have control of it and you can't really feel comfortable like letting go and like being like, I am an adult now. Cause like, I think that is like becoming an adult is being like, all right, I make most of my own decisions now. Mm -hmm. And like, that's what being an adult is, is like, you also have the consequences of making your own decisions. And like, that is like the luxury and, like, the privilege you have as an adult and also the curse of being an adult is, like, everything you do comes back to haunt you, you know? Yeah, and it's your, <laughs> fault. It's your fault. Yeah, uh, and nobody else is to blame, and that's really the truth of it. Like, there are a lot of things that are out of your control, but, like, how you deal with those things are 100% your fault, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and that's, like, the sad thing about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I liked it because I think that the impression that he was waiting for her like it seemed like they were just both living their lives and yeah he wanted to be with her but he kind of like I don't want to use the word friend zone but he kind of like accepted that like okay that part of our relationship that I would like to happen it's not gonna happen so I'm not even gonna like go there I'm just gonna like we're just gonna be in each other's lives and like maybe he thought oh maybe someday or whatever or maybe he totally put that out of his mind like you don't know how many other times maybe this happened where like they hooked up and she was like what? What are you talking about? I, like, whatever, you know, you don't, we don't know what happened, so, but I do like that it's ambiguous in that way, and, uh, I just really felt, I just vibed with this movie, like, I just really felt this movie on a deep level, and I definitely, like, whatever he does next, whether he just, like, is acting or he makes another movie where he is the Orson Welles of it all, I will definitely, you know, I will spend another six dollars, even during a pandemic, although I don't think he made a movie that fast, but who knows, he's pretty impressive, so. Yeah, no, uh, definitely recommend, definitely check out Young Filmmakers. Yeah, and check out, check out, like, everything that was on the South by Southwest slate, 
go find it because I'm sure it's on VOD now and it, you know it didn't get to have the premiere that it deserved and because this definitely would have been like a buzzy film also something better you could do is like uh, watch some of the screenings on uh, Jacob Burns Film Center's oh, website I watch some of the screenings on Montclair Films website watch some of your art house film screenings because most of your art house theaters are streaming movies so don't necessarily stream everything from amazon try streaming from angelica in the city they also have a platform where you could get indie movies that we would have been watching at angelica for more money anyway i think um, you're you're really getting to my heart right now because i think the only place that i love more than the jacob burns is the angelica so like ow but i actually <laughs> i think about those two theaters all the time and for some reason recently, I've been thinking about Jacob Burns so bad. Like, I want to go there so badly. It's, like, hurting my soul. Wait, are they even... Are they have showtimes? I'm going to check. I feel like they're closed because they're so, like... No, I don't think they're open. Yeah, right yeah. Now. We will remain closed as of They have virtual December. screenings. But, honestly, like, that's the best thing you could do right now if you're a movie lover. Like, support your art house theaters. Uh, pay for anything that you can afford to pay for. If you can't afford to pay for things, just watch them. Watch mm -hmm. them on the streaming services that you already pay for because uh, just putting the algorithms up for good movies and, like, directed films that are, like, original, like, that's a big deal, you know? Mm -hmm. We might go through a couple years where franchises die, which could be cool. You know, yeah, like right. that's kind of what it's looking like right now. It's like any franchise film is too expensive to make uh, and requires too many people. So if you could watch an art house film and support an art house director, you might be uh, supporting the future of film. <laughs> Honestly, like do it. If you have any extra money, just do it because these people that make these little tiny movies, it's a passion project. They're not making it because they think they're going to make a million dollars. You know what I mean? It's it's really from the heart. And you can so tell that, like, I love that he was such an auteur with this and he just, did, he's like, I'm just going to do everything. You know, I mean, no disrespect to the crew, which he could not have done it without them. But you know what I mean? Like, he did a lot on this and you could just tell it. Like, this came straight from his soul. Like, this was not, no one's, we're not joking around here. Cool. So any <laughs> other thoughts? Are we, we all good to go? No, because I want to go home and stream um, a, a screening from the Jacob Burns Film Center in Pleasantville, New York. All right. So everybody, please stream some of that. We'll be doing The Sound of Metal probably on the next one or First yes. Cow. Maybe so we'll excited. be doing a First Cow episode soon by Kelly Riker. That's on Showtime Anytime. Uh, if you have Showtime access and if you have Amazon access, watch The Sound of Metal. I can't wait. Listen to and subscribe to the Ashley and Jessica cast. Yes, Where, my pop culture nostalgia. Wait, I can't speak. My pop culture nostalgia podcast. This is the third podcast I've recorded today, by the way. Um, so I can't really speak anymore. But yeah, if you are into two thousands pop culture, especially Ashley and Jessica Simpson, this is the podcast for you. And then Jordan also has some podcasts. Uh, yeah, please just uh, subscribe to this podcast. Get on the Cannabus. Uh, and Young Black Suburban on Spotify, Apple, Google Play, uh, YouTube for some of those podcasts that aren't movie, cinema, film. Uh, yeah, I do video versions for those podcasts because they pay me. So uh, hopefully you guys check those out and then more people will watch and then I'll get paid more for those. Yeah, can so you that I can keep artists? doing these ones. Uh, yeah, honestly. Also, if you guys want to support us, you can support us at anchor.fm slash movie cinema film slash support. Do it. So that's a very easy way to help us out if you guys have listened to this and like our movie recommendations because we save you a lot of time by picking the movie that's good right out of the gate so that you guys don't have to watch the bad ones. We yes. just give you the good ones right there. Um, like... <sighs> Last year, two years ago, we recommended Five Feet Apart. And then who would have thought? We all have to stand five feet apart. <laughs> How relevant is that now? Oh, my God. Very relevant. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.